All right. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to be with everybody. Got a little bit of business to clear up first. Uh, who did this? I found this in my office. For you youngins out here, this is uh, an overhead projector. You might not have ever seen this in your life. This was uh, how we used to teach, right? Clearly in reference to my last sermon, I thought that was hilarious that we even still have one of those. And what's funny is that you guys, when you see this, you think sermons, right? But you know, I didn't grow up going to church, so when I see this, I think quadratic formula, right? That's what I think of. So anyway, uh, clearly someone found this and put it on my desk, I thought it was hilarious. Um, And it's in reference to the sermon we had last week, right? Where we talked about who is the Lord. And we made that point in the lesson where when God reveals his name, it's kind of spooky in in an extraterrestrial kind of way, where whenever you look at the name for Yahweh, a word that has no other equivalent in Hebrew, if you stack up the words for past, present, and future, the tense of I am or will be, uh, I was, I am, I will be, on top of each other, it makes the name for God. And the whole point that we took away from that was who experiences time like that? Past, present, future, all simultaneously. Where would you have to be to experience time like that? And the conclusion was, was you have to be outside of time. You'd have to be the maker of that dimension. And that's precisely the point that God is making about himself, that he is one who is outside of creation, right? And so that's what we kind of discussed last week. Today, uh, what I want to talk about is basically, um, and I, I call the lesson Moses' heart. And it's important that we talk about this because um, it's really sort of a, a, a part two to last week. Now, technically, I'm covering for Mike. He's not feeling well. But it's actually fortuitous because this is going to be closely related to some principles I had alluded to in that message that I fear that maybe I didn't elaborate on all that well. And so I'm going to take some time to really get nitty-gritty to get down to the floor level of what we mean by these crucial bits that are going to carry us later on and forward in the story about Moses and the Exodus and Pharaoh, okay? Crucial things to help us understand. Questions like, why is it that the stories that we tell about God matter and are relevant for how we live today and right now? And so before we do that, go ahead and bow your heads with me. And uh, we'll jump into the text, all right? So bow your heads. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bless you for the great God of glory that you are for being the maker of heaven and earth, for allowing us uh, to have another day of life and peace and flourishing and shalom. We're thankful for the ones on our left hand and on our right, our loved ones. We're thankful for our children. Uh, for our grandparents, our parents, for the families that have been brought here. Father, we give you praise and glory for this community that you have brought us in by the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would equip us by your spirit to be convicted, to be joyful, to go around and to encourage uh, those around us. Um, Save us, Father, from judgmental hearts. Help us to understand that everyone has their own story, uh, their own captions that they are living by. Help us to be merciful in all of our speech and in all of our conversation. Father, be with our hearts and our minds now as we jump into the story of Moses and your holy word. Help us to understand it and help us to bring it to bear on the community and in our own personal lives here and now. Father, we pray for those who are still sick, that you would give them recovery uh, to their bodies, that they might rise up and bless your name. And we do pray this in Jesus' holy name and amen. All right, so uh, I was thinking about kind of how to start, and this week I decided to read, to reread uh, one of my favorite books by C.S. Lewis called Reflections on the Psalms. And the book, you know, is kind of misleading because since the Psalms are really about God, about human beings, about all of life in general, the book is really just reflections about all of life, and it's, it's absolutely brilliant. But there's this part where he, as an outsider, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis didn't really grow up religious, but he asks, why is it that The individuals in the Bible, the Hebrews, they call their law sweeter than honey. And of course, that's a reference to Lewis's favorite psalm, which is Psalm 19, right? Sweeter than the honeycomb. And you think about that, and you just stop for a second. There's that lullaby effect, right? That's kind of weird. Like, who refers to their body of law, their civic, moral, religious, ceremonial, ritual duty as sweeter than honey? And he thought about, you know, what this would even look like for an individual. Let's say someone who's kept from the love of their life because 
I don't know, the, in a previous marriage, they were married to some lunatic who just refuses to die. Or, you know, you think about uh, maybe someone who's caught up inside of a, a bread store, and it's filled with the aroma of wonderfully made bread and coffee. Are any of these people going to look at laws like do not commit adultery and do not steal as sweeter than honey? No, right? So what would cause them to say that? Why would they describe their law in that way? And Lewis has this theory. He believes that it must have had something to do with the relativeness of this law, with comparing it to some of the pagan piety all around the Israelites at this time. Whenever you think about the other laws, I mean, the law of God was not the only law around at this time. It wasn't the only story. It wasn't the only belief. Whenever you compare it to sacred prostitution or sacred sodomy or throwing your children to the fire to the God of Molech, whenever they look at this law, it must have sparkled with an unbelievable radiance, Lewis says. It's all relative. It depends on what you're comparing it to. And so we look at this law, and maybe, you know, we don't necessarily relate to sweeter than honey because... I don't know, we got a sugar problem. You know, we got diabetes, right, in this country. Uh, but he says, what if we said, it's like a breath of mountain air. This law is like crisp, cool water on a hot day, right? That's the way that it feels in comparison to all of the many stories, myths, narratives, agendas, gods, beliefs out there. That's why it's sweeter than honey. It's all relative. And so God's story is the one that we should be listening to. And I want to give you two examples of what I mean by this. Because, again, these are all principles that we're carrying forward in the story. I want to talk about two, just real quick, two examples of what I would call destructive myths, okay? The first one comes, actually, from one of my art history classes, okay? So we're going to have an art lesson again. But I don't know if you've ever seen this before, okay? This is called the Coil Schalke Stone. Coil Schalke was the goddess of the moon in Aztec lore and mythology and religious belief. Coil Schalke, uh, this stone actually is kind of an amazing find. It was found in like the 1970s. And what made it so rare was that it was completely intact and found in its original location. And that happens to be in the ancient city of Tenochtitlan. Now, Mexico City, modern day Mexico City, is built over the ancient city of Tenochtitlan. Now, this city was so amazing that when the Europeans crossed the sea to come over here and they were met with this city, I mean, they described it as something mythic. One of the things they were impressed by was just the plumbing, right? They couldn't imagine the, the sophistication of the technology of this city and the various pyramids that they had all around, this Aztec culture. Well, as they got a little bit closer, they began to realize, well, things are not all that sophisticated as they continued closer to the community. Now, in the story about Coil Schalke, she is a sister of Huitzilopochtli, and, and Huitzilopochtli is the god of the sun. And the story goes that, um, you know, she was first born, and she realized that Huitzilopochtli is going to be born by her mother, and so she has this plan to kill him. And so he jumps out of the womb, completely formed in an adult form, by the way, and lops off her head and then throws her down this sacred mountain where upon reaching the end, she shatters into a million pieces. And if you actually look at the stone, you can kind of tell that even in the way that they depict it here. You can kind of see a dismembered coil shalky, right, even with bones and all. Kind of gruesome there in a spindle format. Kind of cool story, right? Neat, interesting. Well, turns out, whenever they got close to the city, they discovered these things called skull racks. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of a skull rack, but these things were five meters tall and 150 feet long, filled from top to bottom, skulls adjoining each other all around. One of the conquistadors said that they found 136 skulls on one of these things. And the reason why is because in their religious practice, what they did was they basically acted out this myth of Coil Schalke over and over again to appease the gods and various things like that, where they would take their enemy up to this mountain and reenact Huitzilopochtli's victory over Coil Schalke. And so they would lop the head off, throw the body down, and after reaching the bottom of the stairway, they would dismember the person. They acted out these stories over and over again. This was their myth. It isn't just a belief that is separate and apart from anything that we do. We play them out, right? These stories we have about God. Here's a more modern example since we might think that, you know, that doesn't happen again today. Okay, well, 
What we have before us is the Indian god Brahma, okay? Now, Brahma is the creator god in the Indian pantheon. And what's interesting about Indian society is that they have these individuals who are called Dalit. And Dalit, uh, unfortunately, is a terrible pun, but Dalit are basically the worst members of society. They are the bottom rung of the Hindu caste system. Now, in Hindu belief, because of the idea of karma, if an individual is born with any sort of disformity or disablement, basically, that meant you were delete, that you had lived a sinful life in the past, and so you're being punished for it in the present. And to this day, there are parents who will literally drop off their disabled newborn on the side of the road. These delete are the untouchables of society. They're viewed as subhuman. You cannot touch them. Their sole purpose for existing on earth is to suffer for their past mistakes and to take the jobs that nobody wants. Well, how, what does that have to do with Hindu belief? Well, Brahma, it's stated that on the body of Brahma is the support for this caste system. Now, in Eastern belief, they believe that the head is the most holy part of the body. And actually, I remember one time I was with my dad, uh, you know, he's an Easterner, and I was playing out, playing with these kids, you know, I would like, you know, rub them on the head kind of thing. He was like, oh, don't do that, you know. You're not supposed to touch the child on the head because that's the holy part of the body, right? And from the top, you see that the priests and the academics, they're at the very top of society. Then we go down to the arm of the warriors and the rulers. We go down to the artisans and the farmers. And at the very bottom, the foot of Brahma, the dirty foot, are the laborers, the manual laborers, and then not even represented on the body are the untouchables, the delete, all right? It's a problem to this day that they're battling. Our myths are enacted out over and over and over again. And lest we think that there is no application, just think about the various myths we live by today. Now, they might not be attached or tethered to any sort of God that you might think of, but aren't there certain myths that we all organize our lives around, beliefs that we hold very strongly? Can you point to any of them? Can you scrawl any of them into the bulletin that you have before you? Now, what do we do? Do we play Grand Inquisitor? Do we come in like some conquistadors and spread you know, measles and smallpox and, and, and kill individuals and light them up? No. That's what we've done in the past. And believe me, it's not a point lost on me of various atrocities that are committed in the name of Christianity. I have realized that. I'm a student of history, too. But I'll just leave it up to you. Take any of those acts and compare it to the life and or the teachings of Jesus and tell me if you see any discrepancy. If they're reading the same stories about Jesus, they're reading the same Bible, right? No, we don't do that. What we do is we defeat these in the realm of ideas. These are stories that need to be conquered. I believe this is what Paul meant when he said that, listen, we don't wage war against flesh and blood, but against the powers, the cosmic powers over this present darkness. When he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to bring down these ideas that have rebelled against Christ, right? To bring every thought captive to obey Christ. We battle these in the realm of ideas. That's the point. And so, yeah, it matters the kind of stories you tell about God. And Moses is in the business of delegitimizing those false narratives. That's the point, all right? And so let's tether this now to the text by going in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 5. Go ahead and turn there with me, and we're going to jump back into the story, basically continuing where we left off last week, Exodus chapter 5. And as we go through this story, I have a challenge for you, okay? I've got a, got a little project for you. We're going to read this story, and I want you to begin to tell me what are the things, what are the narratives in the story, first of all? What are the stories that people are believing what story is it that they believe, and what are the power structures that enforce those stories, right? For example, Moses and Pharaoh are in here. They represent two different stories. What do they believe? What's supporting that story, all right? Exodus chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Here we go. Now, afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let, pe let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God, lest he fall upon us 
with pestilence or with a sword. Unless you think that's the idea of God being represented as a pagan here, remember, last week we talked about Moses is delivering two different speeches here in verses 1 and verse 3 to Pharaoh, basically speaking his language in verse 3. Now verse 4, but the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of the bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose upon them. You shall by no means reduce the quota, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid upon the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So, verse 10, the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. This is God's word. Did you guys sense that element of tug, uh, tug of war in this story? I'm going to make it very clear, okay? I have mentioned this in the past, but we're going to basically spell this out in great detail, bringing it, bringing it to the floor level, all right? So first of all, we have represented here what is generally called a narrative of empire. And I'm getting these ideas mainly from two people, Marty Solomon and Walter Brueggemann. They talk about it in their books, and I find it so helpful to understand basically the perspective of Moses and Pharaoh. The first is narrative of empire. When we call it narrative of empire, we're talking about exploitation, obviously seen with Pharaoh over the slaves. We're talking about oppression, right? This is Egypt-shaped, that lesson from a couple weeks ago. This is Egypt-shaped. This is the idea that power is God. This is the idea of might makes right, other trite sayings, nationalism, security for Egypt. Israel had no human rights. This is the idea that, that's out of line with what God values. What's it represented by? Look at verse 10, chapter five. Did you notice that parallel? Thus saith Pharaoh, right? This is what I say, work more. No longer are we going to provide straw for you guys. You get your own straw. You guys are going to be idle and lazy. You work more, right? That's the idea. To Moses, Pharaoh says, I'm the image of God. Kings prosper and bricks are made at the cost of Israel's humanity. It's where humans are valued less than Pharaoh's gross domestic product, right? His GDP, where humans are valued less. And you see Basically, his policy of might makes right in number, number one here, Exodus chapter five of the, the slavery. You see the, the policy of limited genocide in Exodus chapter one, kill all the Hebrew males. You see the idea of slavery in general in Exodus chapter two. Another test to kind of figure out where is the narrative empire is, uh, I, heard it said, I heard it said on a video, whatever you cannot criticize in your society, whatever you can't criticize, that's your God. What are the things that are unassailable today in our world that you can't say anything about? That's your God. And so when they asked Pharaoh, hey, let us go, he only gave them more hardship, right? No criticism allowed. Here's the second narrative. This is the contrasting, this is the verses, right? Moses v. Pharaoh. This is God's narrative, what we talked about last week, the narrative of shalom. This is the idea of justice and compassion. This is Exodus shape, not Egypt shape. This is the teaching that not Pharaoh is God, but Yahweh is God. And what's valued in this teaching is order and peace, flourishing, value, relationships. When a God comes up to his people and says, my name is Yahweh, a personal name, your name is Israel, a personal name, and I want to celebrate and have a festival with you, verse 1, in the wilderness, this is a God who values relationship because he's outside of creation and everyone is his children, including the Egyptians, including the Egyptians. Now, we'll talk about that uh, later on in the series, but that's what God values. This is represented in verse 1 of chapter 5 as, thus saith the Lord. Rest, <laughs> right? Not work, Pharaoh says. Rest, Sabbath, Shabbat, right? Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's what he values. That's the idea. To Pharaoh, Moses says, no, you're not the image of God. We are all the image of God. 
Genesis 1 and verse 26. And if I have a creator, then that means I'm not some product of blind chance, but someone wants me to be here and has given me the wherewithal to make something of myself and values me. That's the belief that goes with that. You see this tug of war also, but notice this. So do you see how um, they asked Pharaoh to go worship, and Pharaoh responds, work, right? You know what's so funny about that Hebrew word for work and worship? It's the same word. It's the same word. The point is this. Pharaoh wants them to work. Yahweh wants them to worship. Same word. They both want Israel. Who is Israel going to choose, right? Now, who are you going to choose? No brainer, right? Like, obviously festival, obviously a God of relationship, obviously worship. That's what we're going to choose. But you know what? What's so strange is that what happens is not what you would think would happen. What does Israel themselves do in this story? Well, just read later on. Look at chapter 5 and verses 15 through 16. From their own mouths, what did they say? Check this out. Verse 5, verses 15 and 16. So the foremen of the people of Israel, here's their reply to Pharaoh. They came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten. But the fault is with your own people. Does does it seem kind of annoying whenever I'm screaming your servants to you? That's what the Hebrew author is doing, right? Your servants, your servants, your servants, your servants. It's worded that way deliberate to tell you Who did Israel think their boss was? Pharaoh. They were Egypt-shaped. Pharaoh is our Lord. Pharaoh is the one who tells us what to do. Pharaoh. It's crazy, right? It's absolutely crazy. Think about this. I was talking with Jeremy just this week. We had lunch, and he was mentioning to me about something called the Stanford Prison Experiment. Has anyone ever heard of the Stanford Prison Experiment? Okay, interesting story. I'm not going to go through all the details of it. Basically, they set up this sort of experimental, uh, this experiment in which there were individuals who volunteered for this study, and some were grouped as basically like the inmates of a prison, and the other ones were like the prison guards, right? And you would think this is all pretend, right? This is all fake. No one's going to be able to boss the other one around. And eventually, they fall into their roles pretty, pretty quickly, right? Where the other ones are just capitulating to the other, and the other ones are abusing the other ones. It's like, like it's so funny, human psychology, that we can get lost in these stories so quickly. Another example of this would be a, a documentary uh, that Amber and I watched recently called Keep Sweet. Have you guys heard of this one about the fundamentalist, what is it? The fundamentalist church of Latter-day Saints, right? It's a fundamentalist sect of the Mormon church. And these are the individuals who still practice polygamy, right? Whole expose documentary. And they have developed this community. They, they eventually got to the point where they even had their own town, right? And if you look at this town where there's a cult mentality, where there's abuse of these younger women, you would think there'd be like this big perimeter and gate surrounding this town, and there's all these security cameras keeping everyone in place, towing the line. It's not like that at all. You can leave whenever you want to. And then they had this interesting line in the documentary. Nobody leaves. They had this interesting line in the documentary. Here's what they said. You don't need physical restraints if you tether them with a lie. With social, moral, mental restraints. You don't need physical restraints if you can tether them with a lie. That's the idea. With the beliefs that we promulgate all in society. And so the question for Israel is, like Joseph, do we know who our father is? Is it Pharaoh? Is it Jacob? There are so many ways, so many ways in which people today don't know that they are God's children. They need to be told. There are so many ways in which we still haven't left Egypt. My question to you is, have you left Egypt? Do you know that you are God's child, right? Later on, we'll read in Exodus chapter 7, verse 5, God says that his revelation is for Egypt so that they will know that I am the Lord. He says in chapter 9, so the nations will know that I am Yahweh. But notice in verse 1 of chapter 6 that it's also for Israel. It's so that they, Israel, will know that he is the Lord, that they need to see. Do we know who we belong to? Now, who's going to tell them? How are they going to learn? That's where we bring in the prophet. And I want to have a little bit of fun with this next one, okay? So we have the story of Moses. This is why I'm calling it Moses' heart. 
And that's where Moses fits into the picture. And what's interesting about this story is that if you look again at chapter 5 and verse 1, this is the beginning of the prophetic tradition. All throughout your Bible, especially if you're Bible students, you have read the phrase, thus saith the Lord, right? That's what prophets do. This is what God has said, thus saith the Lord. This is the beginning of that. Moses is the paradigm for all future prophets. He is the archetype of the prophet of God. And so what does a prophet do? A prophet, if you really think about it, they always do two things. And this goes for whether we're talking about Moses or whether we're talking about any individual who has been prophetic. I know in past sermons I've mentioned this kind of, like with regards to Martin Luther King or anybody who has started a movement of sorts, but they always do two things. Your eyes are rooted into a, an idea of contrast. The reason why you can see is because you develop contrast, right? And we like contrast in movies and stories and sermons. We like problem solution. We like pain gain. We like question answer. We like how things are right now, how things could be. A prophet does no different. The first thing that a prophet does, according to Moses, is the first thing is they criticize. Chapter five and verse one, Moses comes on the scene. The first thing he says is, thus says Yahweh, let my people go. And that saying is there to pronounce judgment upon the present ordering of things. It's to engage in a rejection and a delegitimizing of the present order of things, to bring your message to basically those who are of the status quo who benefit from not hearing the cries. Moses comes on the scene and he criticizes, this should not be this way. The second thing they do that is closely related to that is they energize. Chapter six and verse one, what does God say? He says, you just wait and see what I'm gonna do for my people. God's people are tethered to Pharaoh. We're your servants. God says, man, they need to see what I'm gonna work out for them. They need to be able to see, they need to be able to have the imagination to know that there are other ways that we can live, that there's a different reality possible, that we don't have to be so tethered to the present order of things, that the way that we think right now isn't the way that it has to be forever. That there can be a different and alternative way of living, a different community, a different consciousness, a different way to live, that we don't have to fit so easily into the present order. And so you give them encouragement. And Moses, interestingly, he gets this word from God and it eventually just becomes God's word to us, which is that this is the God who has promised, this is the God who loves us, this is the God who uh, says, you are a treasured possession for myself. When we believe that, then we can begin to enact a different consciousness, a different kind of community, an alternative lifestyle. I think you guys have heard me talk about this before, but here's where I'm gonna get into sort of new territory. The third thing that we need to do, if we're gonna be these kind of people today, is we need to begin with a broken heart. Chapter five, verse 22, Moses is discouraged from what he's heard from God's people. And he goes to God and he begins to pray to him. And he says, God, you know, you, you've not helped your people at all. As a matter of fact, you called us and things have only gotten worse, right? This is a Moses who is totally in tune with the heart of his people. He's brokenhearted, he feels it. And so he takes it to God. Pima Chodron has a saying that we should begin with a broken heart. And it's the idea that real criticism Real action, real energy, an active lifestyle can only begin whenever you allow yourself to grieve. When you allow yourself to feel something, it's about the capacity to care, to, to die, to feel, to suffer. And everything about the narrative empire blunts these feelings within us. To begin to be awakened is to begin with a broken heart. And we don't, we don't like this, right? Like, I don't know about you, but I'm not a guy who ever wants to watch the news, at least willingly, right? You know, sometimes Amber is, I'm trying to eat breakfast, and she's just sharing news stories to me. It's like, stop! Don't tell me no more, right? I want to insulate myself. I don't want to hear about all the terrible things happening in the world. And of course, there's... There's a healthy and an unhealthy level of taking in the news. But listen to me. If you're someone who wants to protect yourself and insulate yourself from bad news, listen, that's totally natural. You're human. It's human to long for good news. It's human to long for good things and to protect ourselves from discomfort. But at what stage are we 
when we insulate ourselves to the point that we can't hear anything that's going wrong, and not only that, we'll begin to even feel like it's a threat when people share bad news with us. That people tell us that there are certain things in society that are not okay. We have to push that afar off, right? What does it mean when we insulate ourselves to that degree? We're not beginning with a broken heart. And so we grow indifferent, right? And, and listen, if, if this happens to be you, like me, I'm not telling you to beat yourself up. I'm not here to guilt anybody. I, I, I'm done with guilt. I don't want you to beat yourself up. But I do want to say that we are human. We're wired to seek happiness. And sometimes, listen, even if you do hear a news story, sometimes there isn't anything you can do. There are millions of humans and animals even that are suffering right this second. What are you going to do about it? You can't do everything, right? Don't be unrealistic, but I am saying, begin with a broken heart. Allow yourself to feel. Allow yourself to hear. I remember hearing an illustration from uh, Tim Ferriss and Susan Cain, and they were talking about this commercial, and I had not seen this commercial, but apparently the commercial kind of takes someone through like a hospital wing, or maybe it was a nursing home, and as they're walking through, they're kind of looking through the doors on every side. And if you've ever been in a nursing home, it's, it's, it's very much like a hospital in some ways. And you kind of look through and you, you see this family member and they're, they're gathering together and, and these people are meeting. And the idea was like everyone has these captions, right? As someone you might look in here, you know, they're in stage four cancer. You see them. You don't know they're in stage four cancer, but everyone has a caption. This person's in stage four cancer. This person just lost their mother. This person, you know... Everybody has captions. How would it change us if we began to see those captions, we began to relate, we began to allow ourselves to be brokenhearted about the ones around us, to face our anxiety, to be real about facing the truth? I remember recently, you know, Amber and I were arguing over something, and we got, we got into kind of a, a verbal scuffle and we got to the point to where, I don't know what it was, but we just could not get past each other's obstacles. And we just finally just fessed up. We were, you know, I just hate this. I just hate this situation. I can't do anything about it. I, I, just, I just hate it. And something about those words, just like the elephant in the room was addressed, and we could see it. And a door was open to basically allow us, okay, all right. All right, we hate it, so what are we going to do about it then? right? And you know, me, it wasn't her fault. It's me. I always insulating myself, guarding myself from bad news. I don't want to talk about it. I'm busy. I got a sermon to write. You know, all these different things that we get carried on today, I don't have time to talk about it. By the time I'm done putting my kids to sleep, I get in bed. I'm just tired. I'm zapped. I don't want to talk about anything. You know, you just insulate yourself. And if you don't ever face up to what is wrong, you can never do anything about it, right? Begin with a broken heart. Allow yourself to feel, to know, face it. Don't live in just this generalized anxiety where you're anxious all the time because you're afraid of the big anxiety, right? Jump into the deep end. And when you do, all of a sudden there's activity. There's creative power. There's something you can do to face the difficulties in the present situation, the ordering of things. The last thing that we can do if we're going to be a prophet, 101, okay, is this. We need to be the message. God tells Moses something very strange. You can find it in chapter 7 and verse 1. Go ahead and look there in your Bible. And chapter 4 and verse 16. No amount of ink, not enough amount of ink has been spilled to explain this passage. When God speaks to Moses and he says, you're going to go to Pharaoh, he tells him, hey, you are going to be like God. Do you know what God means about when he tells that to, to Moses? You're going to be like God. He is saying, Moses, whenever I send you to Pharaoh, you're not just going to give a message. You're going to be the message. You're going to be it. You're going to embody it. We're told in the Bible that this is the God who hears the cry in Exodus chapter 2, correct? What in Moses' life has shown us he is anything but like that God? This is the Moses who saw his brothers being abused and stood up and killed an Egyptian, right? This is the Moses who, whenever he's wandering throughout Midian, he sees the shepherds are taking the water from who is eventually going to be his wife, Zipporah, and these other Midianite women, and he stands up against them. This is the Moses who is carrying God's message to Pharaoh, the head of the world. 
God didn't just need Moses to give a message. He needed him to be the message. Moses had God's heart. And that's who God is calling us to be, is to have that kind of heart in the society in which we live. To stand up in activity and not in passivity. I'm going to confess to you something. Just like last week. I have lived in a strong passivity since 2020. And I'm saying I hope that what the book has done for me, this series will do for all of us, which is it has provoked me out of passivity. This is a God who invites us to be active in life now. This is a God who invites us to be active participants in the story, who says, Moses, I have a message that you need to deliver. He's asking us all to be active, to reject that passivity. And so that's what this series is all about. All right, cliffhanger question, and we'll be done. As you prepare for the next couple weeks, whenever we assume the next lesson, we're going to talk about Pharaoh's heart. We're going to get into the plagues. We're going to get about how to read the plagues. And something interesting happens. First of all, Pharaoh is not as impressed about the display of power that God gives than he is about the precision. Why is he insanely occupied about the precision of God's power? And third, secondly, which of the plagues is meant to strike Pharaoh in his very heart? Which one is meant to turn the tide? And I'll give you a hint. It's not the tenth. Okay? So be thinking about that. Bow your heads with me, and we'll go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time where we might reflect further upon the story that you have given us in the Exodus. We pray, Almighty God, that you would arise in us a spirit of activity, that we would reject passivity, that we would think about ways that we can get it all involved, that we would think about ways that we could alleviate suffering, that we would think about ways in which we can listen. Help us, Heavenly Father, to reject the ways of Pharaoh, to reject the ways and the narrative of empire, to reject the gods that he is so like, gods who have ears but cannot hear, eyes but cannot see, mouths but cannot speak, feet but, that, but cannot walk. Help us to be like you, to breathe and to live, to love and to learn. Help us, almighty God, to hear your voice and your ways and to do all of your will. Father, bring about shalom not only for this church community, but also for the community of Brownsburg, bring about shalom for this country, bring about shalom for all of the earth until that day when your righteousness shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Father, help us to partake in the story. And thank you so much for Jesus the Christ who empowers us to live this way and who brings us into new creation himself. Father, we give you thanks and glory, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we do pray, and amen. If you're not a Christian this morning, be baptized. That's the crossing the sea. If you want to be born anew, if you have any need, if you want to confess sins, if you want to pray, we're here to meet you, we're here to help you. Why don't you come right now while we stand and sing a song for your encouragement.